So today, um, we, um, like Danette had said, we have uh, Evan here from Adams County, Mary from Kenosha, and Taylor, who you heard from, I believe in the July office hours from Dane County. Um, they're going to share their experiences use, using Youth Advocates for Community Health as part of a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that is just wrapping up. Um, so these four Wisconsin sites were selected to participate and use the Youth Advocates for Community Health model, and they are here today. So moving forward, first we're going to we're going to talk about like what is Youth Advocates for Community Health. So it's a framework that adult facilitators can use to support community-based efforts to raise uh, youth vo voice and authentically engage young people to address any health disparities that there might be in their communities. So as you can see from the screen here, um, Youth Advocates has five steps of action. Um, they appear circular on the screen, but in reality, they're really fluid and flexible, but still build on each other. The five steps are pre-planning, which raises the foundation, or that which offers the foundation for the group. Um, choose your battle. And this is where um, you feed into the creation of an action plan. Um, the also we have implementing your plan is where young people will implement their plan, decide what they're going to do in their community, who they're going to outreach to, and then evaluation, which is evaluating the plan, but also evaluating throughout the process. So throughout the process, we all, also encourage everyone to celebrate learning and wins, um, and to use that as a model moving forward. So we've had some really good outcomes all over com with communities over Wisconsin, not just outcomes in terms of policy systems and environmental change, but also outcomes um, that show that young people working through the framework reported a, a sense of empowerment, community engage engagement, and better relationships with adults. Um, it also allowed young people to improve opportunities to practice positive health behaviors It increased their knowledge of nutrition and community health and increased community respect for the opinions of young people. So if I believe, uh, can you see the change of screen there? All right, perfect. So we have more information around Youth Advocates for Community Health on our website. I'll put the link in the chat in a bit. Um, if you go to um, blogs.extension.wisc.edu, um, we have information around the five steps of action and also a place where you can download a guidebook which walks you through all of the, the steps of action and offers suggestions. It has some resources. It has activities that you can do with young people. Um, so we just wanted to share that with you as we're, as we're moving forward. So with that, we are gonna hop over to Evan and Evan is gonna share how um, him and some colleagues in Adams County have used Youth Advocates for Community Health to create some community change. Awesome, thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me in this space. I'm gonna just pull up some slides to share with you. All right, so, um, just a little pre-warning. So our slideshow that you're going to see is a youth presentation that our team uh, just presented to a school administration. So um, as you're going through it, just keep in mind it was created and implemented by a team of sixth and seventh graders. So um, our project though was around self-defense. And so we started with our after-school program that happens in the middle school. Um, and we uh, chose to work with them on Wednesdays just because of the time frame. They get out early. And so these youth didn't really have a space to go in between sports and school. So it was the perfect opportunity to um, really connect with them. And I'll get into how we got to our topic in just a moment, um, but I'll just continue on. So again, um, just kind of our organizations of them presenting to the school administration of everybody that came together and collaborated on this oh, background. We So we, we won't play the entire video, but we just gave the school and the students um, background as to what um, community health, essentially what Jen just went over. Okay, so one of our big things that we did was team building. So every meeting, and we met with them every other week. Um, and so in that space though, we always made sure that we did team building or some sort of a connection um, 
activity before we got started. Um, and we really tried to get them up and moving because we were mindful that they just sat in school all day long. And so we um, we wanted to kind of change it up. We didn't want this to be school heavy. Um, and so, so we did connection and we always provided a snack with them as well. Um, and so you'll notice on the right hand side, we have all these flip chart papers. And so what we did is we broke down um, three major categories, nutrition, mental health, and physical activity. And we had them think about the community in which they live in, <clears throat> which would, it could be a city or it could be countywide. Um, and we had them just kind of come up with ideas that they would like to see change um, for the better. And so with that, we had them come up with these lists and they were rotating through these, these conversations with us. And then we just kept narrowing it down and having them vote. And we were just having them move from um, chart to chart and topic to topic. And that's how we landed on the self-defense class um, or teaching those maneuvers to young people for like a youth safety. Okay. So um, again, they kind of gave this like layout and this presentation to school administration about what they've done. Um, and so this was their, one of their slides. So just, again, we gave them the reins for this presentation and we um, guided them as advisors, um, not a lot of control over it. Okay, so then with this, we asked them, we're like, you know, make sure that your point is very clear and it's concise and what we're asking for. Um, so they had voted to try taking the self-defense as like a physical activity um, in the phi ed class as like a mini unit or as a curriculum in that sense. The other route that we discussed with our students was going more of a community route, which then we would revisit if we wanted to go through like a y YMCA or a community organization to help us with that, um, to achieving it. But again, we thought we'd start with the with a school based project first. Uh, okay, and so then we were really in, um, honing in on the importance of like, okay, let's find some research studies that talk about why like self defense is important. So we had them kind of start looking at facts and research journals, which. For seventh graders, um, that can be a bit of a challenge, right? So you have to help them understand um, and how to break down that evidence. Um, but they 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 did a great work at this. Um, and so a piece for you, or a piece that I would say is one thing is we took a lot of breaks. And sometimes during our weeks, we did a lot more connecting on just random things than we did actual um, research work and all of that. And so Sometimes you just have to be mindful that you're working with the audience that you have and just connect with them for an hour. And maybe you only get 10 minutes of work time and just take that as a small win. Okay, so again, just another research study that they prepared and put together. And then some more. Okay, so... I really like this slide. As you can see in this top photo here, there's a, a youth, she's drinking a bubbler. So again, we incentivize them if they could can really keep it on track and keep going with what our project was and our goal, which was to get this presentation completed, um, we would celebrate with a bubbler. So uh, my my point here is don't be, have incentives, have prizes, have end goals um, for your youth if you're working with them. Um, and don't be afraid to just run with their ideas. Uh, the Bubblers too, that was a youth led like incentive. They picked that, they came up with it. I did not know what it was, but it's really just carbonated water if anybody's not aware of them. Um, so again, just more connecting and team building. Um, yep, and then we, we, we met with our school partners just over the summer, uh, just to kind of keep our connection going. Um, that photo in the middle here. So again, creating like a checklist as you're working with youth, just to help them stay on track of like where we're at in our process and what we need to do. Um, we also use that as our like um, divide and conquer, like who's going to handle what part and work on what slide. Um, and so as you've no if you've noticed throughout this presentation, they kind of, they're really different. That's because our 
we did have three youth kind of really take the lead on it. They each de um, designed and created their own slide for the presentation. Okay, so guest speakers. So we asked our youth, like, who knows about self-defense? Um, so myself and my other two colleagues in our office, we were just transparent with them and we told them we don't know anything about self-defense. So if we really take off with this, we have to bring in experts that know way more than we do. So in our process, we connected with a school staff, a school liaison, and then a community partner, um, all who have expertise in um, this subject area. And so this was one of our activities was this community partner came in um, we provided a space in a wrestling room, and he just went over very basic uh, maneuvers with one of his students that is in his um, his school that he teaches on the side. So that was kind of neat. They got to put this into action and to see what it would be like if they did this as a phi ed class or a extracurricular. Um, and so, and it was really well received. Okay, and then this is just us. I'm citing a few sources for our school staff. I'm gonna stop sharing and just kind of open it up for any questions or any thoughts. Evan, I would say you are so brave. Bubbler is carbonated water with caffeine. Oh, so just <laughs> they handled it really well, I'll tell Good. you. Good. Yes. <clears throat> Evan, I was just gonna, you answered my question, but I was gonna ask you about the incentives and then you acknowledged that it was, they were youth identified uh, and, and youth kind of chosen. So I was curious about that. So I love that as well. Yeah, yeah, I remember I was like, I said, what's in right now? I said, you guys are, I said, what would be something that would help us get to this end goal? And they said bubbler and I said, what is that? So um, yeah, so that's how we got to the bubbler, so. They wanted them every other week. And I said, no, we can only do it on like big mile marks, so. That's great. Evan, I know that you guys had a couple of setbacks as you were starting. Do you wanna just kind of briefly talk about that? Yeah, yep. So um, one of the biggest setbacks that we had was just youth recruitment in the beginning. Um, and so the fun thing about Adams County is that it's a very long county. And so to be equitable you and to bring everybody together is hard to do um, from the north to the south end of the county I'm meeting. And so with that, we, we took that approach in the beginning um, and it didn't work because our recruitment just, it didn't take off like we had hoped. And so uh, we, we kind of recircled and then I went in and did the after school program um, for, an, for 4 H, actually. And then in that space, um, I was talking with the staff and they were like, yeah, this would be a great avenue for this type of a project. And so that's kind of how the conversation took off. And so we had, so depending on the amount of youth that we had each week, it would change. But like I said, we had three constant youth that were there every, just, just about every time we met. And so we identified them as like our key like leaders for this project. And we, we even let them pick titles. Like one of them was a, um, a project manager. The other one was a secretary. And then the other youth was a digital manager. So again, just helping them identify roles that like they brought out their strong suits and what they brought to the team was super vital in keeping them engaged. Just if everybody could get anybody that has um, maybe not started any projects or included the voice of young people in the past, if you've done so because you're afraid that you won't be, or be able to recruit young people or you're not sure how, can you maybe raise your hand or give us a reaction or put in the chat? I know when I, we've talked to a couple of health departments, they, that has been you know, the main issue has been not knowing where to start. And if they do know where to start, how to partner with those other people. All right, well, thank you, Evan, so much. I'm gonna pass it over to Mary um, from Kenosha County to talk about their project. 
Thank you. All right. So as Jen said, uh, my name's Mary. I'm here from Extension in the Kenosha County office, and I'll be talking about the Youth Advocates for Community Health Project under the same Well-Connected Communities grant um, that Jen and Evan were referencing, but specifically in Racine and Kenosha counties. So it was somewhat unique and also not. Um, so where we're situated within extension, Racine and Kenosha counties are kind of together under the same supervisor and considered what they call in the same area. Um, so when three of us within those two county offices were contacted with the notion of becoming involved in the project, um, the unique piece is that I specifically work in Kenosha County, then another team member, Pam, specifically worked in Racine County, and then the third, Amy, she worked in both counties. So within that spread, it was going to be um, working with youth from both of the counties, and then also that would help to ensure that within our roles at Extension, we were still working with our community members. Which then we had to really initially figure out who the community partner would be. Um, so a lot of it was meeting some different qualities that we wanted to hit. Um, so just kind of as our three person team, we came together and realized that we didn't want to have to do double of this, um, knowing that it would probably be tricky just to, to bring about kind of a whole new program or project um, from something that wasn't already running. Um, so the few things that we wanted to hit is um, we all definitely wanted to work with underserved and underrepresented youth. And we wanted to find an audience that has youth in Kenosha and Racine counties. We wanted to um, probably utilize existing community partners that were familiar with us as all three of us, or at least one of us, or kind of what extension was, and then also openness to the process. So as we were brainstorming, um, there wasn't a ton of crossover that became like really apparent, but then Amy, who serves both counties, um, threw out that she was already doing some work at the Juvenile Detention Center. So the Juvenile Detention Center is physically located in the city of Racine, um, but it serves more regionally. So the majority of the youth that are there are from either Racine or Kenosha County. Um, definitely a presence of kids from Milwaukee County. And I remember even um, a young person that was there as far as from Rock County. Um, but primarily it was Racine youth and Kenosha youth. So that was a great way to be able to um, hit both of those markers. Amy already had an established relationship with them. Pam kind of had a fringe relationship with them. Um, they were very much an underserved and underrepresented audience, given that access to the young people is only available directly through the center. And um, the openness to the process. So Amy was able to set up a meeting with three of the administration where we went in, we talked about what YAC was, we talked about what the grant process would be and being able to work with some of the young people there. Um, they were really excited right away and said that bringing more youth voice into the center is something that they have had as a goal, um, but just with staffing and busyness and everything else that that hasn't there hasn't been much movement on it. Um, so they were really receptive to it and identified right away a program um, within the center. It's called ACE, but it's um, basically um, a program that kids kind of earn their way into where then they have um, a little bit more autonomy, they have more programming, they have more responsibility. Um, so 
the administration said that this is the group that we would be working with, which was um, great. So once we got in, we started figuring out what the implementation would look like. So we had um, the resources of the team. Um, Pam, one of our team members, had done this in a previous year with a previous audience, but she was pretty well acquainted with what the model was. Um, but there were a lot of parameters around working in this environment and working with this audience. So we were taking all of that into consideration and knowing that we would use the YAC model, but we would have to do some editing or morphing just to make sure that it would fit with our group. Um, then beyond that, we, the three of us, um, dove into some session planning and figuring out how to organize um, somewhat limited time with the youth. So the way that the center decided it would be structured is they had groups of kids divided into an A, B, and C group. Um, and this was established long before we were there. Um, they also let us know that these kids at no point would be able to come together to work all together um, due to just community factors, um, gain factors, just this was an established protocol that they had within the center and have the kids split within these groups. So we were working with three separate groups that varied um, anywhere up to eight, and then just depending on the day could be less than that. Um, and it was going to be in typically 30 minute chunks with each group that we would see back to back to back. So we would kind of repeat what we were doing with each group. Um, and we decided that we would have each be able to create and um, do their own project since the three wouldn't be working together, that that would, um, it just didn't make sense to us and it would make it really tricky. So as we were going through, we figured out kind of what are the things that we want to touch on? Um, so what you see on the screen is just some of the uh, information that we were sharing, as well as, as tools and activities from the guide or from the app guidebook that we would be using, and then just kind of figuring out how to go about that within the sessions. Um, so once we got in there, we were able to get a lay of the land pretty quickly of how like the kids interacted with one another. Um, there was always at least one correctional officer or ACE case manager that was in the room with us um, it, within you know, varying levels of participation. Um, so different ways to be able to get feedback from the staff person that knows the kids pretty well and knows the, the environment. Um, and then just kind of making edits as we went along. So we didn't plan it front to back right away. Um, it really just kind of morphed as time went. So within all of this, um, we did the process of what you see on the screen and then getting more into some of the information that we wanted to be able to present and teach within those um, processes that you saw before. Um, so with the social determinants of health, it was introducing the concept and some of the information um, within the data dive we were taking a somewhat unique approach. Um, we realized pretty quickly that the environment that the young people would identify that they would work with their project um, would be limited to the detention center just because they weren't able to leave, they weren't able to you know, have contact with other community partners at this point in time. Um, so to, to do something that made sense and that would be relevant for the youth, um, it was limited to the detention center. So that was kind of chosen. So when we were thinking about data, it was, um, we tried to get some general information from the detention center, which had varying levels of success. Um, but then also just looking at some more broad information from county health rankings, picking um, Kenosha County, Racine County, Milwaukee County, and then also um, Ozaki County. So kind of going up Lake Michigan since that was from where most of the kids came from before they were at the detention center, as well as just the close proximity of the four counties and the 
vast differences that you see within some of those county health rankings. Um, beyond that, also looking at communication skills, interview skills, surveying, creating action plan, and then the presentation. Um, so within the uh, looking at the social determinants of health data, and then talking through the communication interview and surveying, this was leading up to a, a panel discussion that the kids led with a panel of an administrator, a young person that's at the detention center, as well as um, a general staff member, not necessarily someone from administration. So each group got to do that. And then from there, it was figuring out, identifying what they wanted to center the action plan around, and then be able to present that to the administration. Um, and that's where we really started to see more engagement once the kids got a hang of kind of what we meant, what we were talking about, um, definitely preparing for the panel interview to center it around a few topics that they were interested in and then really narrowing it down for the action plan. Um, and that was uh, uh, very successful up to kind of wrapping that point up. Um, a few things that we used, and some of this is definitely um, similar to what Evan talked about, um, but then there are differences. We had a built-in audience, so that was not a challenge at all. We knew when we showed up at the you know, scheduled times that basically the youth would be produced to us. Um, so that was really simple and was helpful to get us going right away. Um, using question and answer, um, the ways that we did it and the subjects that we were talking about had varying levels of success. Sometimes really open-ended questions, um, the, the groups would be pretty quiet. So depending on what we were talking about, to focus it, um, to be able to just spark some interest or get some conversation going. Um, similar to Evan, uh, treats is always a big thing. So we always showed up with a snack. We would do celebrations as we were hitting different milestones with bringing in pizza and soda. Um, so this was uh, very uh, well received by the young people. Um, tapping into what they're passionate about, personal issues that they deal with, and then knowing um, that what we could bring in would be limited with visuals and videos and um, technology that was available. Um, relying on the staff that was taking part in it for their perspective, and then also just knowing that the vibe of the group would very much just depend on what had gone on in the um, center prior to us being there and just relationships and movements of kids coming into the groups and then exiting if they were going home and all of that stuff. Um, and then movement was just tacked on because a lot of the uh, yeah, uh, team building activities, it not a lot, but some of it is like getting up and moving around and being able to, um, you know, just do different things um, physically. And that also was somewhat limited with the space that we were in, as well as interest that the kids had. So we kept that in mind as we were starting to, to get things um, more zeroed in on our audience. We were able to get to the action plan stage, which was great. Um, and we presented it to the three administrators of the facility. Um, so what I'm gonna scroll through now are the action plans that were identified from the three groups. So this was a template of um, the action plan that we used to guide to help the kids be able to figure out what they were going to talk about. Um, so two of the groups independently chose that they wanted to focus on hygiene products and just um, methods of hygiene within the facility. And then one wanted to establish commissary just to be able to have that as an option. This is where things um, shifted for our team. Um, we presented and it was great. And administration had, was re really excited about it and wanted to get back to us and all of that. And then after that, it was um, kind of radio silence. And um, at that point, our third person, Amy, had left the organization and Pam was moving to a different position, um, but she was still around. She's actually my supervisor now. But 
between Pam and I, we continued to attempt to reach out and Pam even had been able to go to the building for another program that she was doing and made some contact, um, but it never continued or you know finished in that way. We finished in the way that we got to create the action plan and present it, but it we don't even know if they took action with any of what the kids came up with at this point. Um, and they didn't include us to be able to um, assist or kind of utilize what was available within the grant or things like that. So just a few lessons learned um, that to me pointed out the difference between going to an audience or partner for PSE work versus it coming organically and potentially the youth or the organization self-selecting in. So that was something just to consider. Um, also being able to reach the youth was dependable when it was scheduled, but very so we weren't able to reach out to the youth or the caregivers or anything else to try to round up a group if the facility wasn't facilitating that. Um, working with a partner with a lot of rules and regulations, it definitely wasn't impossible, but that's just something to take into consideration. Um, outlining expectations on a continued basis. This is just something in reflection that I think and um, Pam agreed that it hopefully maybe it would have helped but just unsure um, and then just knowing too that we were working within an environment with a lot of crises so there were things that had to take center stage that were just going on um, with the kids with the staff that were there just everything so it was being flexible and being able to go within all of that so that's pretty much it if anyone has questions uh, or anything else, let me know. Thank you, Mary, for sharing. It's such a great project that you guys were able to initiate within your counties. I know you said from your um, the slides you had of there, those are the actual slides that they presented, right? Correct to the administration. Yes. Yep. So okay. this was, um, so we had to be behind the keyboard to like type it in, but we were basically, we had it projected and we were asking them to like fill it in and, you know, figure it out. So they were the ones that um, fine tuned it to be able to represent and say what they wanted. As far as the data jam, were they not allowed access to the computer? Um, correct. So how, how were you able to work around that? I know even in some of our communities, broadband is an issue, being unable we, to use that resource. Uh, on our end, we just prepped to print out some information. Um, and then we had requested some data from the center. We didn't really receive much that would have been relevant to kids. Um, so we it was limited, but we went based off of what we could gather. And then we had physical copies. Thank you, Mary. Does anybody have any questions? I know Mary has to jump off a little early. Mary, I just wanted to, someone's, I, uh, a message was sent to me in the chat and it just says, uh, great presentation, tough place to navigate a change. So definitely acknowledging the work that you did. But I also would say, um, just like the connection Jen just shared. Uh, so we know that internet connections, but also technology usage and utilization can be challenging. And so to think about how we can navigate and overcome some of those barriers based on the work that you did, um, I really also appreciated uh, you just your reflection on the opportunities to learn from that experience and, and how you would do things differently in the future, but also uh, the good that uh, came from it as well. Thanks for also being here, Mary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it is a, a trickier uh, system to navigate, but I we loved working with the kids. It was something really interesting and cool to be able to bring in. Um, there's definitely ways that we and some things that we couldn't control to be able to kind of tool how it ended a little bit differently, but you never know. 
Thank you, Mary. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Taylor Steele. She is with uh, Dane County Extension. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you um, about this internship that I uh, managed that just finished this past summer um, in partnership with the Department of Human Services um, and the Dane County Youth Commission here in Dane County. Um, and I'm just going to start with a uh, background into how this internship got started, um, what came about from um, a need that needed to be addressed, and then we'll go into what the youth that I worked with, uh, what they wanted to do. So Bayou for Youth is a different program that I run. Um, it's for high school students across the county. Um, and it happens every school year. We're getting ready to um, get this next cohort started. It's usually from October through April. Um, and essentially any high school member can apply um, and they receive around thirty dollars to $40,000 in a combination of city and county grants that then that youth committee gets to decide how it gets dispersed back into the community. Um, so we send out a grant, youth serving organizations, school clubs, youth individuals can apply for up to a $3,000 grant. This group of high school students, we review, we, we, we evaluate, and they eventually vote on who gets funded, who does not get funded. Um, and again, these projects really are aimed at um, projects and programs that support K through 12 youth in Dane County. Um, so we had 18 members for 2022 and 2023. And again, this is a partnership with um, UW-Madison Extension, the City of Madison, United Way of Dane County, and the Dane County Youth Commission through the Department of Human Services. And so one of the activities that we do with BIFI Youth is before the RFP the, and the grant proposal for that goes out, um, we do a funding priorities activity, right? So we want to be able to set the foundation for this group of youth to say, what does the data say about youth issues in your county, both rural and urban? Um, and one of the main data points that we, or data sets that we use is from the Dane County Youth Assessment Survey. Um, and that is a survey that goes um, every three years. It's actually started in 19. 80 um, consistently and then ever since 2009 it's been a three-year cycle so we just had the most recent cycle was 2021 and then in January of 2024 is going to be this next survey cycle that goes out 19 school districts participate in this there's um, eight over 18,000 students who take this survey and the questions range everything from what are your sleep habits um, what's your physical activity habits to dating violence to substance use to home life um, really kind of cover the gambit of a youth experience and what's happening in their life. And so we use this, right, to say, here's what's happening. Here's what your peers have said if we're using this data set. And so we um, put over these like, you know, main points around the room. We allow these bye bye youth to uh, engage with each other, ask questions. Um, but what came from it was um, kind of a general concern um, that surprised the adults in the room where we had asked youth, oh, do you remember taking this survey? You probably have taken it. And almost every student had a response that was like, yeah, but I don't know what it's for. Or um, we're concerned about, you know, I know that myself and some of my friends, we don't answer honestly because we're concerned that it's not anonymous um, and particularly, particularly around the sensitive issues regarding immigration status, sexual orientation, dating violence, substance use. Um, students really had this strong perception that even though they were told the survey was anonymous, they felt that when they were in the room, it, that it wasn't anonymous, right? They could feel that their teacher or their peers could see someone's answers. They also felt that if someone really wanted to dive in, they could trail it back to them, whether it be a teacher, a parent, a friend. So there really was this kind of hesitation, both hesitation around the survey, um, and then also just not any kind of knowledge of what the survey is used for. And so for myself and my um, my collaborators and partners with United Way and the city, we all were like, wow, we policymakers, um, decision makers, boards use this data set. Like this is perhaps one of the main data sets that they use. Even UW Health with their community health needs assessment also uses this as a way to shape their policies, a way to shape their decision making, a way to decide where funding gets allocated. And so to hear that there was just such a strong um, youth resistance to this youth assessment 
um, was a little bit shocking for the adults in the room. And so what came of this was later in the year, this past spring, actually the Dane County Youth Commission, as they were preparing for this upcoming survey cycle for 2024, said we should really, um, this is concerning to us too, we should really involve youth. So they reached out to me to say, hey, can we put something together? Can we tap into, um, you know, the BiFi youth that you've been working in, working with, because they're already somewhat familiar with this assessment. And so we ended up being able to pretty quickly pull together some funding. We applied for a grant, got approved. We worked with seven of the BiFi members um, and we had bi-weekly meetings from June through August over Zoom. And um, we did everything from talk about survey development recommendations, right? We went through question by question, um, survey, and then survey engagement and outreach recommendations. And so when it came to the survey development, right, this survey has close to 125 questions. We went through every single question with this group of youth, really trying to say, what's the purpose of this survey, right? Who uses this information? And then the individual questions of being able to present back to the youth to say, how do you interpret this question? What do you think that they're asking versus what were the researchers trying to understand or gain from this question? Um, as well as thinking about you know, the relevancy and applicability of each question. What's missing? How would we respond to this? How would our peers answer this? Um, and so they had a lot to say <laughs> about each individual question from ranging from grammatical errors that were found in the survey um, to, you know, having consistency of some questions said, does your, do your parents do this? Some questions said, does your parent or guardian do this? And so they were like, that should be consistent throughout. Um, a lot of times, some of the questions were um, just confusing in nature. Um, and it wasn't, it was, was not clear what they were asking. Um, and so one of the questions was, you know, in terms of your um, school environment, what's important to you? And it was stuff about, um, you know, DEI in schools, youth voice in schools, um, youth getting involved in school policies. But the way that the question was framed was, it seemed like it was asking you, the youth to rate like the degree of how their own school environment is participating in these things rather than their own individual um, opinion about the importance of those things. And so that distinction was really important. Um, and again, they also really had a lot to say about um, questions regarding sexual contact, in particular, involuntary versus voluntary, and really diving in and going question by question. You know, um, there were all sorts of questions about voluntary sexual contact, and maybe only one question about involuntary sexual contact, um, as well as the um, definitions of each or the way that the question was phrased. Um, youth would go in and say, well, this is really missing a key demographic or a key population who would answer this way. Don't researchers want to know X, Y, and Z? So again, going through every single question, the format, the readability, and the relevancy. Um, and, you know, overall, they really wanted to, you know, um, as we dove in through all of these, all of these documents, all of the survey, they were surprised to know of just how much this survey was used, right? They did not know that it was a partnership with the Dane County um, Youth Commission and the Department of Human Services. They didn't know that there were 19 school districts involved. They didn't know that this data was used by the public health department. Um, and so really just increasing that knowledge of what this is used for, and that will increase youth ownership of this survey. Um, they also wanted to put additional support and resources within the survey. So reminders of confidentiality, right, when those sensitive topics do come up. And then also resources available. So if a student does indicate that they have a substance use problem, then they will be pointed to substance use resources to help them with that substance use. Um, and so again, this was, you know, there's a lot of questions about dating and domestic violence, substance use, um, drug use. So they really wanted to say, hey, this survey shouldn't just be answering these questions. It should youth also getting to know what the resources are that are out there to help them. And so we also then dove in, the Dane County Youth Commission wanted to know how can we continue or improve engagement and outreach among youth for this survey that happens every three years. And so we really broke it down of the pre-survey, you know, pre-survey, 
the day of the survey and post-survey what youth recommended should happen. And we looked at all of the documents um, that the Dane County Youth Commission gives to parents, gives to school districts, and youth combed through and really came up with a strategy um, you know, that will improve that youth engagement and youth outreach. So for pre-survey, right before the survey even happens and goes out, they recommended that um, the Dane County Youth Commission establish a group of youth evaluators, evaluators every cycle. So perhaps one to two students are nominated via school or school district, um, you know, as representatives, almost like a house of representatives kind of model, um, you know, and so for this this 2024 cycle, right, which is already happening, already underway. I just wanted to point out um, kind of the differing timeline. So if you can kind of see in the red text there, this is what happened for this most recent year, where in January and February of 2023 of this year is when the schools and the funders and the public health department and the Department of Human Services comes together to kind of, you know, let schools know, let funders know, get everybody on the same page. Through March and April, there's a survey development group where they're going through questions, they're analyzing data. And then it wasn't until June until they reached out to say, oh, we should probably involve youth in this. Um, and we were able to luckily get things together re relatively quickly because this was a group I had been working with previously. But for 2027, for this, for the next survey cycle after this one, youth really wanted to have earlier contact, right? So when you connect with schools and funders in February, that's when you're also connecting with youth. They said that in April, right, there should be almost be like a open house within school districts so students can learn not only about the survey, but also how to get involved. And then the summer worked really well for these meetings, um, but then just that continued youth involvement, not just one piece of the puzzle, but they are the connecting thread through this entire survey. And in day of the survey, you know, one of the things that they noticed was how inconsistent um, it seemed to be where even though schools were given a checklist or, you know, a script to follow, students said that oftentimes teachers were overwhelmed and also couldn't verbalize what the survey was for and how it was used. So again, just really um, thinking the day of, you know, putting themselves uh, in their peers' shoes and also for themselves, right? Remembering what it was to take this, what it was like to take the survey and how to um, best minimize student concerns, um, you know, and, and again, just, just get that information out there of how important the survey is and how important it is um, of a data set. And then post-survey, students really wanted to have access to the survey results. They, um, I think that's one thing um, in working with youth is that they just don't want these one-off interactions. They very much are in tune to say, what is, when I, when I have a focus group or when you interview me, what is that information being used for? And can I look at it when it's done and compiled? Is it a report? Is it a presentation? Um, is it a meeting? Like they want to have access. They want to know what their, um, what their lived experience, what their words, what their recommendations are being used for. So they actually um, not only wanted to have access to the survey, but they wanted to be able to filter through by their school um, because a lot of students said that, oh, like within our school clubs, you know, we could, you know, have, almost have like a separate data set that really shows the demographics of our particular school or particular school district for us to apply for funding for um, our clubs or our projects or initiatives. And so overall, you know, this, um, it, it really was about how do youth giving informed opinions and recommendations and solutions around increased ownership and knowledge of this survey, right? So, you know, they're, they're getting hands-on learning about survey development, developing research questions, they're bringing in their lived experience and expertise. Um, there was a huge difference then when they presented these um, recommendations to this survey development group, where adults in the room were like, oh, wow, we've had this question on the survey for years and years and years. We never thought that that this is how youth are interpreting the question. And that's just so important, right? You know, it's just so important to show that through this process, this is about gathering youth experiences and youth data, but yet researchers had no idea that youth were interpreting specific questions in specific ways. Um, and again, you know, having, um, increasing the perception of the survey and what it's being used for um, will improve those responses, right? And ultimately these youth recommendations and youth solutions will improve policy, will improve funding and programs um, because the survey will be more accurate. And again, 
um, you know, they really wanted to keep this survey engagement and outreach. And so knowing that every cycle there is um, intentional youth involvement, right? It connects both rural and urban youth com communities across Dane County. Um, and again, just values the survey um, in terms of a data set. And so these are four of the students that, that we worked with. We worked with seven this summer. Um, and again, they, I mean, that's the best part about working with youth is that they're just so amazing, right? You can kind of just give them, um, you know, give them a starting point and they will take it where it needs to go. Um, but in terms of recommendation, in terms of how this program was set up, like this wasn't a program, right? This was just a need that an organization had that was like, hey, can we pull something together? And one thing that made it work was we came up with a consistent schedule we had a stipend um, and also was hybrid. A lot of these students either were taking classes over the summer, they were working, they were traveling. And so having that those set dates really helped with um, participation and attendance. And again, you know, really reiterating the importance of getting youth involved in the beginning versus later on, right? So it wasn't until the beginning of the summer that they were like, oh, we should probably involve youth. Thankfully, we were able to you know, kind of pull things together relatively quickly. But I, you know, it's, it's, I like to imagine what would have happened if in January, right, that, you know, reaching out to youth or having that foundation, foundation and having them be a part of this process from the beginning, really wouldn't have made it felt so rushed. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that, you know, I know that when um, we get requests all the time from health departments, from um, from clinics saying, you know, we have funding for this youth program and we just don't know where to start, right? It can be totally overwhelming. It can be, you know, just like, I don't even know either. It could go in so many different directions, but I just want to reiterate that like this started off as like, hey, can we do this? It was a question. It started off small. Um, we, we intentionally started it off small and then now we'll have a strong foundation to make bigger decisions later down the road. Um, we really, something that really helped us narrow down what needed to happen was really thinking about what kind of deliverables do we want at the end of this? What kind of outcomes do we want? What's the scope of this? What do we want to achieve as this work group? And that really helped it feel not as overwhelming, right? And not feeling like we have to solve this whole issue in one summer. No, absolutely not. Um, but overall too, it's really putting that trust in youth, right? Youth are informed, youth have that ownership of whatever program or project or initiative you want um, to have happen in your organization. And also just trust and acknowledgement that they have the expertise, they have the lived experience, they have the knowledge to shape that program or initiative, right? And it's totally okay for them to, um, for you to hand over that power to them because they will know what to do. Um, and so again, like this, you know, working with, with this group was so fun and they're gonna be researchers and evaluators uh, when they're adults, I can tell, um, because they just had such profound, um, just, they were just, they were incredible, right? They were in a room full of adults and they stood their ground and said, we disagree or this, we agree with this. This is what needs to happen. And they were just wonderful representatives of their peers. So, um, you know, just again, in summary, like these programs, these projects, these initiatives can start from someone saying, hey, can we do this? And kind of working together with partners. It can be an established group of youth. It can be a group of youth that you just kind of pull together. Um, but again, as long as that foundation is built of youth know how their voice and how their input is being used, then they will feel passionate about it. And they will just bring your organization, bring that project to a whole new level just because you have them at the table. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, for Taylor. Yeah, of course. And I have my email here as well. So if you have other questions that you want um, or, or need or want me to go into greater detail, please just let me know. Thank you. All right. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, the only other piece that we have, or reach out to Taylor, we'll provide our information as well um, in the email afterwards, um, is that if you would like a one-on-one -on -one consultation about any of the extension programs, any opportunities, resources to schedule any sort of training around um, adolescent well-being, or if you have questions or you need some shared brainstorming, right, just reach out. We have 
a core group of educators that are really fantastic and have a lot of knowledge in these different areas. And a lot of them are in your counties, like, you know, for like Taylor, she would be, she's a fantastic resource. Um, if you would like to, you know, start a group or if you're working with a certain group um, and just getting it off the ground. So we just wanted to, to put that out there. And if you can, again, fill out the evaluation that Jeanette had put in the chat, um, that would be fantastic. Jeanette, do you have anything else to add? No, I was so uh, intrigued and drawn into Taylor's message. I actually didn't put the thing in the chat again. Oops. So let me go ahead. If For those of you that are on, hang on for one quick second. And uh, let's, uh, there we go. Let's get our evaluation in the chat. That's an opportunity for you, us to get, for you to give us feedback. Let us know what you're looking for, but also to let us know if this was impactful or beneficial for you. Um, if you're on and, uh, and have questions and would like to unmute or um, uh, ha engage in some conversation around this topic, even though it's 10 o'clock, um, I certainly can stay in this space and engage in conversation with you, um, even if Taylor or Jen need to leave. Um, otherwise, thank you again for taking the time to join us today, and we will share this recording out. And um, again, feel free to engage us at that youth health email. We're happy to support the work that you're doing and bring youth voice uh, into your efforts as well.